Good evening. Yes. I think I'm, I'm challenged, <laughs> so I'll bring the mic down if it's okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, Dr. Maya Ntwaisani, Director of UNISA Press, His Excellency President Tabo Mbeki, the Chancellor of the University of South Africa and the patron of the TM School, Professor Sabelo Gachening Glovu, Chair of Epistemologists, Epistemologies of the Global South, University of Beirut in Germany. Members of the panel discussants, Professor Mandla Makanya, the former principal and vice chancellor of the University of South Africa. Professor R.H. Nengunkulu, former director of the School of Governance, UNISA. Professor G.M. Gondo, UNISA Council member, former Vice Chancellor, and a member and editor. Mr. A.B. Magwe, the editor. Professor Tenjwe Meiwa, the Vice Principal Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation, and Commercialization at UNISA. His Excellency, M.A. Maya, Ambassador of Somalia and other members of the Diplomatic Corps here in present. Professor T. Moja, Professor New York University, former chairperson of UNISA Council present tonight, members of the University Council present, government and business community representative in attendance here tonight, members of UNISA executive and extended management present, representatives from various institutions of higher learning present, UNISA retirees and other staff members, representatives of various forums and labor organizations, special guests of Prof. Mandla Makanya present tonight, Distinguished members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I wish to extend a warm welcome to you on this auspicious occasion wherein we celebrate the contributions to the knowledge arena through publications of an important book which marks the historical milestone and processes that Professor Mandla Makanya has bequeathed us with. In particular, I'm quite thrilled to be with such esteemed company, uh, which one can only ascribe to this esteemed and retired VC who has contributed not only to the leadership of the knowledge systems, but continues to contribute in the knowledge arena. It is not often that one has the pleasure of attending a book launch, particularly now in the COVID-19 pandemic context. It is in fact quite a thrill for those of us who have written books will know that it is notoriously complex and time consuming process to even just draft a paragraph. More so when the book in, cause, in question represents the cumulative and culmination of such a seminal and defining period of one's incumbency and a very significant body of work. Of course, every book tells a story, and in this case, this volume that Professor Makanya has written, which is titled Making an African University in the Service of Humanity, Professor Mandla Makanya's speeches, is not only a chronicle of a personal journey but it is the former Vice Chancellor's account of his contributions to shaping of the biggest and most impactful university, which is an accompanier and a partner to the country, the continent, in expressing the best of knowledge systems in the global knowledge arena. His contribution to a higher education sector, the country and the continent, is quite important to mark particularly through this book. But the book also adds another chapter to the University of South Africa's history 
and charts its development through what has arguably been the most complex, if not difficult, decade, wherein the histories of South Africa's education, the contestations about knowledge, the global and local relevancy, and the contextual exigencies that has marked it have been quite projected. And so, in so many respects, the book reflects a sense of completion of a job loyally and faithfully and well done, Professor Makanya. It also marks a transition from a turbulent yet rewarding chapter in which the laying of the foundation of new ones and the new trajectories of your journey are incrementally and productively recorded for the current and future generations ought to learn with the, those who have journeyed before them. We must therefore express our own collective congratulation and appreciation, Professor Makanya, for the sheer amount of hard work and effort that have gone in keeping the hand on the tiller of this huge ship that is UNISA, as evidenced in the integrated narrative and stories of speeches included in this volume. We know that there were many more speeches and addresses that you gave to UNISA community, the, the country, and the global uh, arena. However, you have carefully selected those speeches which you felt spoke to the imperative of building knowledge communities for epistemic communities are necessary for building countries, continents, institutions, but more so for the intellectual formation of new generations and younger generations that need to understand the value and role of higher education as a progressive aspects of ensuring transformation, development, accession of people's humanity and also people's dignity and their right to being human. These speeches we appreciate because they've been included in the book in order to ensure that institutions located within the continent ensure that the voices, knowledge systems, civilizations of Africa find expressions and African identity and personhood, ontologies and epistemologies are constantly at the center of rethinking knowledge. Professor Makanya, we as the collective at UNISA in our country, but also in higher education systems, owe you a debt of gratitude for your commitment and dedication and significantly for your contribution to society through your leadership of many institutions, but also your contribution as a leader at UNISA. Not only did you start in the academy as a professor, but you took leadership in varied instances, including as a dean, pro-vice-chancellor, and vice-chancellor, and even in those responsibilities, you ensured that your contribution is recorded to posterity in our institutional, sectoral, and national annals. It is as it should be. Our appreciation must also go to the editors of the book, who were your dialogical interlocutors, and who ensured that as you reflected on the ideas around higher education, knowledge systems, curriculum change, transformation, and all associated discourses that are relevant for ideation, theorization, research, internationalization, innovations, ensured that you took the most pertinent narratives that record a powerful story and history. It only remains for me, colleagues and gentlemen and women, to once again welcome you 
almost warmly to this historic book launch and to invite you to join me with our speakers, editors, as well as those of you who are participating virtually to express our gratitude for the memory lane that Professor Makanya in the past decade at UNISA has journeyed and recorded for us. I wish to extend my congratulations to you, Professor Makanya, and hope that all youth and young adults who study at UNISA or higher education in South Africa and in the world take into cognizance what it means to shaping Africa's knowledge systems, Africa's humanities, and to projecting their knowledge systems in the global arena. Thank you, and I hope you are having a fantastic time and awaiting good reflections around your book. And we would be definitely welcoming students, academics, experts in rhetoric, in literature, and other disciplines to engage the speeches of Professor Makanya in varied platforms, including in speech, in writing, but also in the social media platforms that youth and young adults often share and interact with the knowledge domain. Thank you, colleagues. Have a wonderful day, and congratulations, Professor Makanya. Raul Thank you, Madam Vice-Chancellor. We can comfortably say now that we are home. We've been welcome to, to share in this knowledge table where we're all going to find whatever will fill our soul. Making an African university in service of humanity by humility in a humane manner, guided and led by servant leadership over a period of years. Without wasting any time, I'd like to call upon Professor Sabelo J. Mkovuka Jenny, the Chair of Epistemologies of the Global South at the University of Beirut in Germany. Professor Gajeni, over to you to give us our keynote. Thank you. Good morning. A whole protocol. We must deliver this address on this important occasion of the Anas entitled Making an African in service of humanity. I'm not sure whether people can be in this case. Hello? Can I continue? Uh, Professor Sabel, can you hear me? You, you may proceed. Yes, I can. Please, please proceed. We can hear you. Yes. It was a for which made me to stop. Um, it is a very important item to the body. Great. Professor Makanyas. I'm making an app and it's of 
kemana nih? Uh, Professor Gagen, if you can hear me, please pause a bit, <laughs> because we cannot hear you. Um, and I think the audience has also missed part of your speech. But maybe what we could do, because I have your speech with me, could I rather read it for you while colleagues are still trying to sort out the connectivity? Uh, Professor Gagin is in Germany, so we are just sorting out the technical and connectivity. We, will that be in good order? Just to make sure that the audience and Professor McCown and the editors do not miss the gist of what you said from the beginning. Uh, I think, colleagues, let's do that, and our apologies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a speech by Professor Gagini, as he was saying it. And it starts a reading greetings to all and all protocol observed. It is indeed a great honor to be invited to deliver this keynote address on this important occasion of the launch of Professor Mandla Makanya's book entitled Making an African University in Service of Humanity, consisting of Professor Makanya's engaging speeches delivered different in different occasions during his tenure tenure as Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Africa. I readily accepted the honor, even though it was on short notice, mainly because I could not say no to Professor Makanya, under whom I served located within his office for almost five years, first in the Change Management Unit, and later in the Department of Leadership and Transformation. And partly, became, and partly because UNISA remains my intellectual home, where I worked longest in my academic career for nine years. I did this in different capacities, and I continued to be affiliated with it, and indeed committed to its succeeding 
into a fully-fledged African university in the service of humanity. I must say from this outset that during my time in the principal and vice chancellor's office, one of our attempts was always to get into Professor Makanya's mind and indeed try to understand in detail his vision for the University of South Africa so as to give him the maximum support. This meant that as a unit and department, we constantly read his speeches which expressed his ideas, dreams, and vision for the University of South Africa. Turning to the book itself, I must first of all join all of you in congratulating Professor Makanya for gifting this important work. Capturing his voice on many subjects, challenges, and themes to do with the difficult task of transforming and indeed decolonizing universities. For me, the first outstanding feature of Professor Makanya's book is its main title, Making an African University in the Service of Humanity. One can underline three important terms, and they are one, making a university. This means that Professor Makanya never assumed that he was taking over an already made institution of higher education. He clearly understood that his leadership involved remaking a university which a context of transformation and decolonization of institutions of higher education in South Africa was very critical. This important task arises from the historical legacy of Africa in general, and South Africa in particular, where we have universities in Africa rather than African universities. The second point is African university. Therefore, Professor Makanya was clear as to which direction he was remaking UNISA from a university in Africa into an African university. Here, Professor Makanya rose adequately and committed himself to the task of carrying the historic burden of the broader African revolution with regard to institutions of higher learning. A historical burden that was well expressed by the Association of African Universities as far back as 1967, when it was stated that, and I quote, the truly African university must be one that draws its inspiration from its environment, not a transplanted tree, but growing from a seed that is planted and nurtured in the African soil, close quote. And the third point I want to make is in the service of humanity. That is a deeper and broader understanding the burden of service, which to me defined Professor Makanya's tenure tenure as principal and vice chancellor. And the speeches collected into, his book, into this book bears a testimony to scholar, educator, and leader who understood service in its diverse and complex dimensions. I say this because the question of service of the university has always generated some debates with leading African scholars. Professor Ali A. Marui stated that, and I quote, a university has to be politically distant from the state. Secondly, a university has also to be culturally close to the society. And thirdly, a university has to be intellectually linked to wider scholarly and scientific values of the world, close quote. In Professor Makanya's book, The Service is to Humanity. I must say the sheer volume of the speeches and diversity of their subjects and themes give us a picture of a very active leader, an engaging leader, a communicative leader, not shy of the podium, and a voice that was never muted by always loud and clear on pertinent issues to do with the making of UNISA into an African university in the service of humanity. Whether the unisons got the message loud and clear in another, is another question. But in Professor Makanya's book, we have this idea verbalized and now published for all of us to benefit. Across the speeches, one hears the voice not only of a sociologist, but a humanist par excellence who spoke from his heart about the pertinent issues of decolonization, ranging from scholarship and epistemology to gender-based violence, racism, 
sexual harassment, and indeed rehumanization of the dehumanized as central leitmotif of transformation. I must say that as Professor Makanya retires, and he offers us this major gift, and indeed this manual on leadership in higher education, he is comfortably joining a pantheon of illustrious emeritus scholars, educators, and indeed leaders from whom universities and the country at large will continue to tap into their wisdom and wise counsel. What do you make of Professor Makanya's speech and their papers? They tell us that Professor Makanya is a great communicator of ideas. They are a treasure trove of wisdom. They inspire confidence and give direction to us. They are full of motivating ideas and wisdom. Reading all the speeches, one gets into all the dimensions of leadership in higher education. Through the speeches, Professor Makanya emerges as a leader who always thought about others and always paid tribute to them and made sure they are kept alive in our memories. And that is why there are those speeches which spoke about other leaders. Let me end by highlighting two speeches which stood out for me, partly because they demonstrated consistent consistency in Professor Makanya's vision and partly because they remain as relevant today as they were at the time of their delivery. The first one. The first is the delivered on 17th of February 2011 at the official opening of the academic year. And the second is that delivered on the 29th of June 2016 at the launch of the Leading Change Project. The first speaks to service to humanity and Professor Makanya gave content to this important idea by distilling and gifting UNISA with timeless values, the 10 Cs plus one, called communication, conversation, community, connection, care, collegiality, commitment, cooperation, creativity, and courage. In that speech, Professor Makanya spoke of a revolution in thinking and emphasized the need for looking into the mirror of souls and acknowledging the need for transformation. Like all true humanists, Professor Makanya encouraged all of us to adopt a willingness to acknowledge that we are all part of the problem, so we must all be part of the solution. I am certain if we embrace this wisdom genuinely and purposefully, we will not only successfully remake our universities, but indeed our world into a welcoming place for everyone. Five years later, following the roads must fall and fits must fall moment in South Africa, Professor Mawakanya was back on the podium to give direction on transformation of UNISA. And what stood out for me is not only the clarity of the five pillars of change, but how the core values outlined in 2011 were brought back to breathe life into practical transformation of UNISA. And this are transformation of scholarship, meaning to change the very idea of university epistemology, curriculum and pedagogy. Secondly, transformation of institutional culture to make making UNISA a home for all. And thirdly, the transformation of system to make the system serve humanity invoked in the title of the book. Fourth, transformation of leadership in direction of ethics, accountability, and responsiveness, not forgetting courage. Fifth and lastly, developing change discourse predicated on engagement, consultation, and communication. Professor Makanya's speeches are indeed an expression of communication of ideas, vision and plans, as well as mode of mobilizing stakeholders to stay the course of a painstaking journey of transforming a university. These are some of nuggets one gets from Professor Makanya's book, from his speeches, and I wish to thank him for this gift. Your book will be a reference point on leadership. The leadership taking over from you is blessed to get this gift. You played your part. 
The very act of publishing your speech is an act of courage and openness to public engagement. You have set the bar high for us. I thank you. Thank you, colleagues. This uh, is the speech of uh, Professor Sabelo Gajeni, who we had uh, connectivity uh, problems, but he was able to grace us with sending the speech. Uh, we want to thank uh, Prof. Gajeni for giving us such insightful, informative, and rich text in his keynote. He gave us a moment to sit back and reflect, both on our purpose as individuals, but together of our purpose as a collective, particularly in higher education, and maybe focus on challenges and future opportunities on higher education. And I want to echo what Professor Kajen is saying in his speeches. This will arguably be one of the manuals on guiding the leadership in higher education. At this moment, I'd like to call the participants on an interactive session. If I could call Professor Mandla Makanya, former uh, principal and vice chancellor of UNISA, to, to take a seat. Uh, be followed by Professor Nengwe Kulu, former director, School of Governance at UNISA, to also take a seat. Uh, Professor J.M. Mkondo, the UNISA council member and an editor of the speeches, to follow them. And uh, lastly, Mr. A.B. Magwe. Mr. A.B. Magwe and Professor Nkondo are both the editors of this work, and they will really be engaging in interactive session of, of this book. Can we give the colleagues an, an, a, a big round of applause? <laughs> My colleague will give the colleagues the mic and, and, and really we'll start with Professor Makanya to uh, kickstart the interactive session. Uh, to get the conversation going. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Makani. Oh, oh, okay. No, thank you very much, uh, Program Director, Dr. Uh, May Antwison. Let me, in the same vein, thank the, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Pulen Linkabula. And just to say, it is good to, to, to hear you. Um, it is important, just before I can make my remarks, you know, to thank the Chancellor of the University, uh, President Abumbegi, um, who is the Chancellor of the University, but at the same time, for the marvelous work that he has done, you know, in putting together the foreword uh, of this book. And I also want to thank the members of council uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Mabua and the entire membership of uh, the council. I'm saying this primarily because in the nature of the work that you do as a vice chancellor, that you have the council around you. So before his time, it was uh, Mr. Simulani leading the council. And during the time of my appointment, it was uh, Dr. Matthew Sposa. What actually is interesting here, which I want to talk about, which in, view, in my view is necessary to mention, is a point perhaps that um, one needs to bring to bear during this discussion. This is mainly that which I communicated during the time of the appointment of a vice chancellor at uh, the university. And the members of the university community uh, will recall that time, um, particularly because it is my view that it is that moment where I spoke about the beauty of a mosaic and indicated that when we are appointed into a leadership position, the understanding that must be uppermost in your mind is that you'll be working amongst others 
who are leaders on their own. So the extent to which they make a success of various parts of the work that they do lifts that level of the beauty of the mosaic. So that is what I don't, I don't want to lose sight of because it is in my view illustrative of the beauty of what we are talking about today. But secondly, that the understanding of how history is made that is woven within the context of the developments that are happening at various levels. And you find that that which ultimately is the marker of what we're talking about is in the context of a journey. It is not simply just a moment. So in the context of the journey that we're talking about, it is those steps that we are actually walking over a period of time. But those steps understood within the context of a contiguous nature of relationships, the extent to which what we're talking about at this day and age is what it was when the university was established back on the 26th of June, 1873. What levels of transformations the university has undergone over decades to a point where we began to reimagine this university in light of us being on the African continent and doing precisely what Professor Ndorfukachin is talking about, that we are not simply just a university in Africa, but we are an African university. How do we begin to spell that out in a manner that captures the imagination of virtually everyone else so that we can begin to travel this journey together. I also want to mention that I'm one person who's not necessarily worried so much about hierarchical structures that you may find within organizations. What comes to me almost immediately in organizations is the extent to which relationships begin to matter because I see that which you make as arising out of those interactions on an ongoing basis. That's primarily the core of the kind of interaction that I spoke about when I mentioned for the first time the whole notion of the 11 C's plus one. So as having been spelled out once again, by Prof. Ludovic Arceni, they are actually also captured fairly adequately in the book, and you'll appreciate that. But what is significant in this instance is that that, in my view, was a commitment to build a new DNA in the university that will actually then be bring about or spring up what one will view as a culture of academic excellence, service to the stakeholders in their entirety, as well as the efficiencies and effectiveness of the work that we have to do, with an understanding of building this agile university that is not only agile, but a high-performing institution of high learning. So I like the point once again that is being mentioned to say that's a commitment that we make, but the extent to which we then succeed to travel that road remains something that we consistently pursue because you work with others. So the success that they make is determined by what they define at any given point in time alongside that which you've already defined, but at the core of the journey is a strategy. Now our strategy is the anchor, if I might put it that way, which then assisted us to drive this transformation agenda that has helped us to build this institutional ethos within the institution and the institutional culture which was then underpinned 
by these 11 C's plus one. So they were not simply just operating on the margins, but rather at the core of the work that we are doing. So I just want to say that as we progressed as a university, we then began to see a situation where I said to the university community that then we need to be vigilant against challenges that may be confronting us along the way. These challenges that we confront also have been mentioned in the keynote address, where we find that we step on each other's toes, we bully others in the context of us trying to achieve our strategy. What I was warning against was a situation where we have to ensure that having inculcated the ethos that I've spoken about, those developments will be inimical to the type of an African university that we were committed to build. So the question of our own professional conduct, our own personal conduct, must be coupled with integrity and high levels of integrity so that this university can indeed become an Afghan university. As I entered the terrain, we are working on the basis of the agenda that we knew at the time as a UNISA agenda for transformation in making an Afghan university, which took us through that period. During that time, I began then to embed this ethical culture so that we can understand that as stewards of the resources of the university, which by definition are resources of the country and everyone else who is viewing themselves as a public, that will be important for us to understand that it's incumbent upon us to know what that really translates to. So that as we manage the institution, everyone else must have that high level of consciousness by the time we began to work on the current strategy 2016-2030, which of course has had various iterations, it was clear that we had already begun to walk this path in a manner that showed our deep commitment as a university in advancing humanity, in solving the challenges that are facing humanity, which partly then is encapsulated in our vision. This clearly meant that as an African university, we do not, under any circumstances, dissociate ourselves from being globally competitive in a manner where what we do will be bolstered by the reworked values that speak to the leadership style that one had introduced at the time. That's primarily what then you find embedded in the values that we're talking about as a university of this day and age, which is ethical and collective responsibility, integrity, innovation and excellence, responsive student-centeredness, and dignity in diversity. And finally, just to say that I was fortunate that I stepped into the shoes of the leadership that have been presented at this university with distinction by none other than Professor Nyameko Bani Pichan, that I had the luxury of working with both as a dean but also as a, a pro vice chancellor. That it made me to understand that the environment that I'm talking about can only see the light of day if we understand this contiguous nature of various parts that we have a responsibility for. Keep them intact within the context of understanding that they are integral parts of the whole that will take us into this future that we so desire. Thank you so much, Program Director. Thank you so much, Professor Makanya. Without any waste of time, we call uh, Professor Nengwekulu for his uh, uh, 
uh, reflections and engagements on, on, on the text. Uh, should we bring the mic, Prof, or you want to come to the podium? Come to the podium, Prof. I think for is uh, Prof. Ngondo will also come to the podium? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that we some immediately. Thank you, uh, Program Director, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Makanya, Professor Ngondo, and other colleagues that are here. Um, I, I want to focus on the obstacles that were placed in front of the attempt to transfer UNISA into an African university. Uh, UNISA has a history of struggle. For leadership. If you look at it before 1994, uh, there was a complete struggle for the vice chancellorship. Um, the building around here is called for Fido Van Fake. It's the one that was actually supported by the Senate. But there was one professor who was the head of you know, library studies, but he was also the head of the brother bond. Because one of the things that um, perhaps we don't talk more about it is that UNISA had the center of the brother bond, which was determined to maintain UNISA as a white university, despite the fact that you know, most of the students were black. In, um, after that period, I remember there was one professor here, uh, Glenn Hans. Um, I, I attended at the University of Pretoria, one of my subjects of political science. So I knew him from there. He was part of the Bobeas Modi. And uh, in the 40s, they opposed the National Party. He was appointed here to Nisa as a senior lecturer in 1956. He remained a senior lecturer. He taught students, graduated under him, they became professor. I think he only became professor, if I'm not mistaken, either 1993-94. Now, when the Professor Makanya's predecessor, uh, Professor Pichana, was identified as somebody to be appointed, the structures of UNISA created a conflict between him and the other one was black person was acting. It became a struggle. When Professor Makanya was identified as a vice chancellor, of course those who manipulated, they manipulated, it became a very struggle, struggle between two blacks with the same position. It had nothing to do with the academic excellence of any particular individual, but rather to appoint somebody who actually would not perpetuate and reproduce the policy that had been developed by you know, uh, the Pichana and uh, Makanya when were the Provost Chancellor. I, I was a UNISA council member in 2004 when I was in government. I remember when I arrived there, I looked at the agenda and I wanted to know where, where is transformation here? And one white professor was sitting next to me said, no, is spread all over. So I said, no, but it must be prominent. Uh, in, that set, in that council meeting, we came out with the UNISA 2015, but that was not the end of the battle. The battle continued. You know? no, so I'm not sure some of the things that um, Professor Makanya have said in the book, because I've not seen it. But perhaps the biggest battles that Makanya, Professor Makanya had fought was not in speeches somewhere else, was in the Senate. And, and I hope that, you know, some of the statements, he used to make a statement before the council, council Senate meeting started every time. Firstly, there was a struggle of actually trying to transform curriculum so that it reflects the interests of South Africa, black South Africans. That was one of the biggest problems. The second big problem 
was that why is it that we don't teach some of the subjects develop indigenous languages? No, indigenous languages are not made up of translations. It's to teach, to develop even the scientific dictionaries, indigenous languages, all of them. One of the success that Professor Makanya was able to make was that, you know, the student exam questions were set in all you know, 11 languages. All those students could answer in English. But the problem of transforming curriculum has been a big. And I'm quite sure that the, the new vice chancellor is going to be faced with the term resistance. You know, arguments are actually couched in what appears to be academic and scientific arguments, whereas they are real and political decisions. It has been a big battle here at UNISA to replace Africans in English. You know, these countries is not made up to English. Uh, when I was in high school, I didn't care whether I spoke Africans or English, that they say. But I wanted to know why indigenous languages are not chosen. I went to a school where half of the teachers were white, half were black. And I asked my teacher one time, you know, what, what, what's a widow or inventor? My class teacher didn't know. I went to the principal, Gisek, uh, who said, no, you see, black people don't have the concept of a widower because they had more than one wife. And I think I was being from one, I said, but there must be those who could not marry more than two. When they, where actually the wife died, what do you call them? He said, no, we manufacture a word. I went with the colleagues of Monday village and I found the word which is not the word. So the battle even at UNISA has been the battle of dealing with indigenous. Some people said, but you can't teach mathematics in Susutu, Susana, Kosa, Zulu, Shiva, and Swanga. But mathematics is not a language. It can be taught in any language that they have. You go to Middle East, Japan, China, they write in their own format, but they still teach mathematics that way. So for me, the biggest struggle that you know, Professor Makanya fought was biggest at the Senate level, the resistance to change, to change all those things, even peer promotion. No, one, one of the things that was very interesting here, uh, I did a study when I was invited by council, I think 2017, to go and address them. I asked the uh, equity office to give me the list of all the staff, and I found that, you know, there were only about, you know, about two, two, 60 to 16 African black lecturers. But some of the colleges, colleges of accounting sciences, it had no single African professor whereas a professor with a PhD in doctorates, chartered accountants, a number of them. You know. So for me to, to transform that Professor Makanya and Pichana before him had tried to transform UNISA into an African university, which meant that you know, it must also focus on indigenous languages. It has been the biggest struggle that we have. And of course, as usual, there have been all those, you know, Connection. There are people who went to organize students so that they can be removed from the first chance. For me, these are some of the most important things that we deal with. When we talk about an African university, it must be a university that actually nurtures its own culture, languages, and so on. You know. We tried, you know, a number of colleagues at the, at the Senate, that we must send, set up a center for the development of indigenous languages. You can't be told that we're doing translation. When you speak Vanda, Zulu, Toza, Sisutu, no, it's not translation. It just embraces a number of things. So I think for me, one of the most important things that, you know, Mandela had done, but try to find that, you know, one quality that he had is that he would listen, he would keep quiet when he would agree, and answer when it's appropriate for him to answer. For me, that is the battle that I think, and knowing the current vice chancellor, that she will continue with that battle. Otherwise, UNISA will never become an African university. For, for me, that's what I wanted to say, that you know, perhaps if you had not included those statements in the book, Professor Nakanya must actually have another smaller book which contains the statement that is made about curriculum transformation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, okay, so 
So thanks very much, uh, 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 Program Director. Really, it's a privilege uh, for me to be asked to, to say something about the legacy of somebody I knew as a family friend and then later grew to be a colleague. Um, uh, it's a really a moment. This moment becomes much more complex and uh, much more urgent because it's not just Prof. Kanya we are talking about. It is the current Vice Chancellor we are talking to. I think that and that and that uh, that uh, 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 dynamic it makes what we say here extremely important. I have about nine, nine reflections here. But before I go further, let me acknowledge you know, my co-editor, Mr. Ebi Magwe. We worked very well together over the years. And, uh, and it has not been very easy because of the material we have to deal with. But so I want to acknowledge you a bit for, for your work. As a seasoned journalist, it made it easier for, <laughs> for both of us to work together. So I also want to acknowledge the support that uh, Professor uh, Tenjwe Mayu offered us as the Deputy Vice Chancellor in terms of, in, in, you know, for research, I think it's important that we do so. I have said nine points that I want to raise. The first, when you, when you, when you read his speeches, you know, in, in 2018, as somebody representing council on Senate, I proposed to Senate that uh, after listening to Prof. Makanya for some time, I was so um, inspired that I felt, you know, we had to collate these speeches, publish them, and so make them all available to publics beyond the immediate publics of UNISA and to, yeah, and to, and to new generations. That proposal was warmly, you know, accepted by Senate, and when it went to Council, it received the same kind of cordial reception. So I think this is not just a statement of editors, it's an universal statement. The first thing, uh, and I wanted to address it to my friend and colleague, our new Vice Chancellor, the first thing that uh, 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 and, and, and we say that in the preface, that uh, you'll have to look, look at very carefully, colleague, it's what Makanya says in so many words. Briefly stated, it is the pastness of the past and its presence. The pastness of the past and its presence. And now you, as a, as a new vice chancellor, must negotiate the future out of that tension. I think it's important that we do that. The second thing that you'll have to deal with, call it new vice chancellor, that what we, what we put together, me and Abby, are patterns that go back 10 years. Patterns of experience, patterns of ideas, reflections, some amount to tradition. <laughs> but your challenge, Madam Vice Chancellor, is to negotiate the tension between the patterns that are reflected in the speeches and the particularities you, you face on a daily basis in your office. The particularities are part of the pattern. 
But the priorities are much more than the patterns because they try to bring into the present the future. So there is a tension here. When you read the speeches, you say, but yesterday I was at that meeting, at that meeting, how do the patterns you know, reflect the particular encounters I have? And how can the tension be negotiated? I think it's a, it's a lesson which we called in council institutional learning. If there's one thing that uh, we as council should assist you with, is what we call institutional learning. An institution that does not learn from itself, that does not learn for, from its experience, is going nowhere. But institutional learning is a social science. It needs expertise, it needs high level competencies, or now to read the past and the present, and how to prepare the future out of the tension of the two. So that's very important. That So we need, uh, uh, Madam Vice-Chancellor, to identify a set of capabilities that the university needs to learn from Professor Makanya's wisdom and his memories. I think it's important. The whole question, do we have the capabilities? What does it take to change this university fundamentally? It just, it just can't be rhetoric. It just can't be exposition, scholarship, elucidation. It's deeper than that. So I think, I think we, we need to work together, both your council and the vice chancellor, on this question of internal learning. We are raising this, not for the first time, we raised it last year when we were working on the new strategy. If you go through the records of council, institutional learning is very important. We cannot, we will have, we, we, we have ourselves to blame if we don't learn from the past. And I think it's important that that learning curve is made official. We suggested last year in council that we need a high level task team to help you read the past and how to negotiate the future. The first one. The first one we went there with which we discussed with Pramakanya is brilliant speeches. We talk in the preface introduction about the extraordinary coherence, the thematic coherence that binds all his speeches. In, in, in incredible scholarship. The command of the intelligence come to you know, it's very, very important that we do. But you see what? That is one thing. The thematic coherence, conceptual power, conceptual clarity, being on top of experience, at least conceptually. The problem, Madam Vice Chancellor, is the disjuncture often, not only at UNISA, but in this country the disjuncture between poli policy aspiration and implementation realities. That tension is deep. It is deep in history and yet and it has its own political economy. I want to repeat, this is very clear. The tension between policy aspirations. You read our current strategy, we have vision, we have mission. We even have governance structures. But in your office, you have to deal practically with the tension between the vision, the mission, and operational behavior. Which leads me to the next point. I've said so many times, I want to say it now, that uh, not only in Indonesia, but in this country, if you look at public service, if you look at government, the tension between policy aspiration and implementation realities, that tension, council and senate make policies, but those policies become effectively policy 
the way they are implemented at operational levels. So the conventional pedantic distinction between policy level and operational level, that, that pedantry we have to overcome. You can see it in your office, fortunately, you are working with people who were themselves vice chancellor. You can see it in your office and have brilliant ideas, very articulate policies like our government, a brilliant constitution. But the people who make policies are down there, middle level, lower level, those who enact decisions on a daily basis. They effectively are the policy makers at UNISA. Not council, not senate, not parliament, not the executives, but what is called street level bureaucrats. And please be religious about that. Watch out for operational levels that can undo all your wisdom and all your brilliance. I think it's important that, um, that, uh, that uh, I mentioned that. And I think that, uh, that when I look at Prokhor Makanya, it's very clinical analysis. You cannot find anything more articulate, <laughs> more eloquent on change. And that's why we feel very strongly to anthologize them. But you see, you are a scientist, you are also a theologian. What you have to deal with, what Professor Makanya points to and, and experienced, that you can accumulate all the evidence about a problem. You can decide that here is the evidence that we're going to use to make a decision. But evidence is politically flexible. The way people interpret evidence and the way they make decisions based on evidence, there's where the problem is. You can, you can collect evidence on a problem, but how you interpret it is almost always politically flexible. And I think it's important for that, you need high level skills around you on a regular basis to advise you on those speeches. So let me go back and say what, what, what made us, you know, uh, to, 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 to put together this SS, me and Mr. Marco, is, the, is the, the debates that you see in the speeches. You are a scholar. You find the debates about structure. You find the debate how to restructure things, how to transform, how to do it fundamentally. Those debates, you are very much aware of. Some of us who have read your scholarship know that you are very sensitive to the order of things and how structure and laws and policies can themselves be, pro be very oppressive. So I think it's important that, um, that, uh, that. And something else that, uh, that, that Pramakanya was very good at, and that's why it is so strong on the African dynamic, on African civilization, which is very strong on that, is the primary importance of identity, even in global politics. That's why he says, let us build an African university. The whole question of identity is very strong in Pramakanya and very strong in the discourse on transformation in most post colonies So we are saying that the University of South Africa should be an African university, but in a global context. A way of saying that is you must mediate the way it links up with other universities in the world. That tension is very, very important. That's why somewhere he talks of the internalization of higher education. And in the last 10 years, he established so many partnerships and alliances in the world. He's real. One time he chaired the, 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 the kind of global association of orders. But he knew the importance of, of, of going the tension between the particularity of identity 
and the need for global relevance. That tension, I think, is very well articulated in his work. So, so let us also, the next one, and, and you yourself uh, referred to it the other day when you're opening Senate, that, uh, that you know what? You can talk of difference. We can talk of identity. But you know what? At UNISA, with our 350,000 students, at UNISA, with so many people coming from so many cultures and so many worlds, as you could talk about identity, please find, find a framework and establish an openness to equivalence. Not only identity, but equivalence is important. The sharing of capabilities. That's, very, and that's why in, and when we talked about decolonization, fortunately in, 20, in 2017, Paul Makaya put together a team of vice principals, and he, he asked me to he asked me to chair it. When we're talking about decolonization, there's a tendency to move towards authenticity, to move from integrity, a tendency to emphasize Afrocentrism, which is very healthy. But we have to accept that at UNISA and in this country. The West is here permanently, and so is the East. So we have to develop a new epistemology, what we call inter-epistemic epistemology. It brings together an, a number of epistemologies, a number of knowledge systems. You say, now that we are here, when we solve a problem, how does Western epistemology and African epistemology work together to solve poverty, to solve gender-based violence, to solve unemployment. So we concretize epistemic equivalences and not overemphasize differences. And we say also that difference between African and Western civilization is not antagonistic, is not oppositional. We made it oppositional ourselves. Intrinsically, they share a lot of capacity. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is compelling us to appreciate our shared vulnerabilities. So we move from, from, from uh, hegemony to inter-epistemic epistemology. It's very important. But finally, let me just say that it's one thing for us to to go through this, and we'll go through this with you in a sustained manner. But at the end, let us make sure that this conceptual power, this scholarship that Professor Makanya has asked for us, helps us to solve one, Madam Vice Chancellor. The unacceptable high failure rate of students. We are here, that's the core business. We can be called scholars, we can do anything, but unless it translates into improving the high failure rate, we are a failure as a university. And the failure may not be in students. The failure may not be in staff members. The failures might be institutional, by the way. So there are three kinds of failure possible at UNISA. The failure that students sometimes are as lazy and don't work. The failure that some staff members you know, are indifferent to them. The failure that you know, the bureaucracy, you go through a number of contorted decision clauses, but the failure might be the failure in the institution itself. There are three kinds of failure. And the last one that we plead with you to find time to look at very, very carefully. With that, we want to, want to thank Professor Makanya for allowing us, me and uh, AB, to anthologize this and make it available to the country. We want to, 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 to also apologize, you know, to, to really thank you for involving uh, Professor Gacheni. It so happens 
uh, a man and vice chancellor that today UNISA published, just published a volume of essays called Social Memory as a Force for Social and Economic Transformation. It's a bit about 30 scholars have got that. Pro Professor Makanya has made a contribution to, to that volume. And I think his chapter appears with uh, Judge Albi Sex at the very beginning of the anthology. So please do that. That is extremely important that we harness all these things and make all those things available to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Vice Chancellor uh, Melin Kabula, um, Prof. Meiwa, Dr. Antwesane, with whom we worked very closely on this project in his capacity as head of UNISA Press. I would like to thank, um, I would like to recognize Prof. Harry Nangokulu, and I would like to thank my co-editor, Prof. Ngondo. Because Prof. Gondos, um, he's old school in many ways, and he brings to someone younger like me a lot of joys of readily available wisdom. So for that, I'm eternally grateful including when we disagree on things, you still walk away with some good lessons. I would like to particularly, ladies and gentlemen, thank Professor Amanda Makanya for the confidence that he had in me and approaching me to become part of this book project. I'm immensely humbled and it gives me great joy to see today, in this moment, the ultimate fruition of our joint fruits of labor. Make no mistake, Makanya was actively involved in the production of these works. And when I wrote the introduction to this book, it probably exchanged between myself and Prof. Makanya ten times before we ultimately settled on the final version during which I then began to realize and appreciate the enormity of the work that lay ahead. I recognize members of the media, my very colleagues who are here. Thank you so much on a Friday evening to be able to be with us and record this wonderful event, not only for knowledge, for our various audiences, but also for historical reasons. 
ladies and gentlemen, I have a, f a lot of speakers before me have made remarks about many aspects and I would like to labor on some of those that have already been touched upon. However, I would like to assist you by focusing mainly on the manuscript with which we wrestled, which is a volume of Prof. Makanya's speeches. Because when one went through each and every one of those speeches, and there were many, too many to count, it began to give me an idea of 10 years of Prof. Makanya's leadership of this important institution, the biggest university not only in our country but in the continent and of one of the foremost in the whole world. I walked away with a number of observations from working on this book. These include Prof. Makanya's conscious commitment and dedication to the development of African thought leadership. This he did by focusing on knowledge, at knowledge architecture in the form of particularly the less heralded African scholars. And the one that comes to mind readily is Eskiam Patele. When I went through the works of Eskiam Patele by engaging with Prof. Makanya's works, it pained me to begin to recognize the extent to which Eskiam Patele as an African intellectual was more revered overseas than he did in his homeland and country. Prof. Makanya started as far back as 2010 the annual Eskiam Patele lecture Most of these took place in Eskiam Patele's uh, province of Limpopo. And they focused on the contribution, immense contribution, literary works of Eskiam Patele to the overall knowledge production in South Africa and the world. And that brought me to the Making of an African University in Service of Humanity, which is the title of the book. And I looked at this, Prof. Ngondo, my colleague, and I thought, what, what an apt, what an appropriate title for this volume of speeches, because it, it is premised on our fundamental ethos as Africans and South Africans in particular of Ubuntu Bodu to say whereas we are an institution of higher learning and one of the foremost for that matter we nonetheless recognize the socio-economic dynamics with which most of our students, particularly over the last 15 years or so, since the advent of democracy 26 years ago almost, the university population has been younger and younger by the years.
Prof. Gacheni, from his speech read by Dr. Ntesani, correctly point to Prof. Makanya's interaction with students at the heart of the feast must fall. And when I go through the historical works of Prof. Makanya, I come across clear and adulterated evidence of a VC who really was seized with ensuring that inclusivity was a more preferred path to growth for the university as opposed to exclusivity. And for that reason, it did not surprise many, particularly those who knew Prof. Makanya well and were closer with him, that by the end of the feast must fall around 2015-16, one of the key demands of the students, which was to insource the workers who had been with the university for donkey's years but were not on the salary books of the university had to become now employees of this university. The benefits for the multitudes of those people is immeasurable. And the one that immediately comes to mind is access of those employees by their children to this institution to become students. When you go through this book, you will also come across Prof. Makanya's again consciously focusing on women and their struggles. The LGBTI struggles which have been on the periphery for many powerful institutions and individuals as well as groupings in this country enjoyed massive support by this university under the leadership of Prof. Makanya. And when recently President Ramaphosa likened gender-based violence to a second pandemic, after COVID-19, my mind raised to my interaction with Prof. Makanya's works as we are in the process of putting together the book. That women at UNISA under Prof. Makanya's leadership enjoyed clear and camouflaged support for their upward mobility and every year Prof. Makanya attended whenever it was humanly possible for him he attended functions whose objective were to recognize women at UNISA and their achievements and at those functions, it will be folly, my brothers and sisters, to think that it was all camaraderie. The focus was not only on the good side. The focus would also be on the persistent challenges that women continue to face, not only at UNISA, 
but also in the broader South African, African and global societies. And this, as part of Prof. Makanya's legacy, is actually reflected in this collection of speeches in the book that Prof. Nkondo and I had worked on. I want to turn on Prof. Makanya and his focus on our contemporary history which we will be quite unwise to forget, particularly for its brutality. Annually in this university, Prof. Makanya hosts the Steve Bigo Lecture, Mandela, Ivy Matipe Kaseburi, Charlotte Matege, Tabon Begi, and a number of others. And it's not only a feel good kind of an effort by Prof. Makanya, again, it is a conscious effort on his part to bring with him the entire university population, particularly the students, and indeed the teaching, the teaching staff alike, to the awareness and remembrance of where we come as a country. Because our failure to appreciate such intervals of history will no doubt result in our past being swept under the carpet by those who constantly and unwaveringly hold nefarious agendas. When you go through this volume of works, my brothers and sisters, you will also come across a number of MOUs that Prof. Makanya entered into with a whole lot of institutions, Johannesburg, City, the municipality, the close working relations with Tswane Municipality, which is on our doorstep here. Institutions in KZN and other MOUs entered into between UNISA and stakeholders as far as Eswatini, Swaziland. And that showed for me an individual at the zenith of this institution who understood and appreciated that no man and no institution is an island, that partnerships and cooperations are the way to go. And this Prof. Makanya, as this book bear witness, masterminded to no end. I want to make my last two points now, my brothers and sisters. And the first one is going through Prof. Makanya's body of works his attempt at repositioning the University of South Africa as a higher learning of choice. His emphasis on ODL, and I was very fortunate 
to travel with him at some point to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in his capacity as the head or one of the executives of the continental body on distance, open and distance learning institutions. And we were there for days and I witnessed Prof. Makanya working far away from home. And whilst we were that far from home, Prof. Makanya would be in meetings with other stakeholders back at the university. In the middle of the night, he will be with his other colleagues in Dar es Salaam, engaging on the work for which we had traveled to that part of the continent. Madam Current Vice Chancellor Mepuleng Lengabula, from my interaction with the works of Prof. Makanya, it gives me great joy to realize and recognize that bold efforts and attempts have been made in repositioning UNISA. However, it will be folly of me not to point out that a lot still needs to be done. COVID-19, as my colleague co-author, Prof. Nkondo was pointing out, has brought to the fore the common vulnerabilities of societies all over the world. However, I want to hasten to add COVID-19 as a phenomenon has also brought to the fore the very hidden opportunities of cooperation and forced our brightest brains into their own spots and corners of innovation. Back here at home, UNISA is the leader in distance education. And to the leadership of this university, Please, if you drop the ball, there are desperate competitors waiting on the wings to grab the opportunity and leave you reeling behind in the glory of your historical reputation. But remember, Reputations alone are not sufficient to carry you into a brighter future. All these contact universities around the capital city, including all universities in South Africa, none of them must successfully challenge UNISA when it comes to the traditional offerings of distance education. And this we must do through improved technological development of our systems. When all universities were looking at UNISA last year to offer examinations online, there were incredible trials and tribulations from within the university. And as an outsider looking at the vantage point, it really took me aback that a university that has been in existence for more than 140 years 
was almost been beaten at its own game by traditionally contact the universities and that should not be the case madam vice chancellor i raise this as someone who loves this university and who has a history with this university and who wishes nothing but the best for this university there is no other unisa technology and our access to it and the available resources means we should not only leave our competitors reeling behind in South Africa, but we must be competing toe for toe with our fellow institutions of higher learning all over the world, all over the continent, and show why people in Berlin, people in Washington, people in Asia still prefer to study with this university regardless of the long distance because UNISA is reliable and that's the reputation that it has built over all these years more than a century so this is my party in short current VC please technological development is not beyond reach it is available assemble all those bright brains that are available to ensure that all other universities in South Africa knock on your door for advice on how to teach students online so that we don't embarrass ourselves as UNISA to go to a traditionally contact university to ask for advice on how to do our work. Prof. Makanya, well done, my brother. You've had good innings. It has been wonderful working with you on your project. It has humbled me immensely for you to express that confidence in me and say I should be part of this. I will eternally remain grateful for that. And as you move on in your new chapter, may all the years that you have spent at UNISA serve as a fountain of wisdom into the new terrain that you are entering into. And remember, as I say in the last paragraph of my introduction to the book, UNISA will always be your home. Please continue to look back as you move ahead. Thank you very much for your indulgence, ladies and gentlemen. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues, for that interactive session. So I shall not try to rephrase what has been said. Also, to respect time, if I could ask uh, uh, Madam Vice Principal, Professor Tenjwe Meiwa, to the Vice Principal of Research, Postgraduate Studies, Innovation and Commercialization, to come and give us the word of thanks. Thank you. The Chancellor in his uh, absentia, His Excellency Tabo Mbegi. The Minister of Education, Science and Innovation in his absentia, Dr. Blake Nzimande. Members of Council who are um, watching this phenomenal celebration. The Vice Chancellor and Principal of UNISA. Professor Lengabula Mapos, our ambassadorial teams and dignitaries who are in the hall, 
and participating in various platforms, Unisense, alumni, funders, friends of this great university, Dr. Tandlovo Kacheni, editors and respondents to the book, this great book, and more importantly, the celebrity of the day, the celebrity of the launch, Usingaye, Professor Makanya, San Bonan, Moluin, Tubilang, Havwan Tumilang. Good evening, all protocol observed. As the program director has said, my name is um, Professor Tenjo Mewa. I'm the publisher of this book. Um, and therefore, a very important stakeholder of this ceremony and this launch. It's an honor for me this evening to render the congratulatory remarks and a voice of thanks related to the product that I have not only published, but a product that I've lived with, a product whose experience I've lived with, this book, Professor Makanya Speeches. I express my honor, accompanied by my operational team, who've worked workless, worthless, again worthless, as my language will put it, the seven 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 that produced this book, working like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> One of them is laughing. To render this final product. I'm actually accompanied by them, many of them are not in this room, but I know they're watching this launch, to say congratulations to you. And to say thank you to you, but thank you to Prof. Makanish for making us to work that hard. Had this product had not been around, we would not have worked in the manner that we did. The launch, ladies and gentlemen, this evening is a culmination of Prof. Makanya's perseverance, strength of character, dexterity, and many hours of hard work. Thanks, Putman. Congratulations. You deserve this honor. In our aspiration and gratitude at UNISA, we actually hold that we want to continue to drink from this cup of the wisdom and the legacy of Professor Makanya, and that we want to continue to learn from your leadership and embrace the mission of an African university in the service of humanity. In the spirit of thanksgiving, as expressed in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, I want to offer thanks from the opening remarks that we got from May Puleng Likapula, the principal and vice chancellor of the university, who set the scene, reminding us of what the mission of the university should be and how it is crafted by this book as one of the leaves that we need to be looking from, taking from, and learning from for a pathway to come. If anything, Vice Chancellor, how you started, in my, I'm actually sitting there and trying to write notes, and I'm thinking, could be crafting a piece of paper here for publication, publisher. Um, this launch could not have happened in a, in a better month than this month of human rights. It talks of humanity, and your opening remarks accentuated that in terms of the importance of how a human being is for this university, as expressed in this book. Thank you, Mandela Makanya, for that, for these speeches through which I lived, from which I hope to continue drink. The keynote speaker, Siakolisa Ndovuka Jeni Usema Zweni, for the fact that we could not hear your voice, but having heard your voice and having touched you before COVID-19, 
When my colleague Dr. Tosana read your speech, I could actually feel you. We thank you for your reference to the leadership text to which you made about this book that we're launching this evening. And the fact that you've referred to it as a framework to which we must refer and from which we must draw. We thank you, Prof. Makanya, for that, for all the work that you've done leading to Ndlovukajini sitting overseas in Germany as one of the leaders of the epistemologies of our decoloniality philosophies to express as such means a lot for us. And we thank, we thank you, Prof. Sabelo Ndlovukajini, that you continue to be a unison and I actually have to thank him that just this month he's given me a publication so he'll make me look good with the Vice Chancellor. We then moved on to the interactive and the discussion session in which Prof. Makanya took us through one of his legacies, 11 C's plus one. He delved into that as his book portrays the importance of, again, humanity, and one element that's very crucial, which is an element that's expressed in this book that is the African University, indeed, shaping humanities for the African soil. Thank you, Prof. Makanya, for that, for that reminder, which led to Prof. Ngengengulu, former director, School of Governance, calling for inclusion and the highlights and highlighting the importance of indigenous languages. You know, when you made reference to, to that call, to the curriculum that's very conscious and not just only translating, but integrating in, into the curriculum, the indigenous languages, your voice evoked Fanon's belief that, I quote him, to speak a language is to take on a world, is to take on a culture, close quote. Indeed, we want to be equal as a misamanagement to the task to which you called us. As we crafted this evening's launch, Prof. Gondo reminded us, our UNISA council member and editor of this book, co-editor of this book, through the nine points that he stated, reflecting on the philosophical importance of those nine points and which are regarded as a bad cause, something that we as management of UNISA, as well as all UNISANS and alumni, to say this is a bad cause that we need to take on and that from the patterns to which you made reference, the capabilities and tensions that we need to be aware of, that exist between policy aspirations and implementation and the need to have coherence in order to be able to respond to very well to a university that's not just only on the African soil, but an African university that advances humanity. Thanks, Prof. Makanya, for giving us this launch as an event to remind us and to Prof. Gondo for actually accentuating that in looking at the patterns and capabilities and the tensions that we need to be aware of there. The co-editor, Mr. Abby Magwen, went on in depth sharing with us the content of the book. And in particular, I just want to pick up what stood out for me, Mr. Magui. Actually, it's two points from your reflections and discussions. Was your highlighting of women's human rights that I eloquently expressed in the Makanya book. And Dr. Magui, your reflections reverberates what Ellen Kuzwayo's beliefs when she asserts her, her open quotes. Some people st still think that feminism is an African and call it Western feminism, a close quote. And in your making mention of how eloquent gender analyses are in the book of Prof. Makanya, you indeed demonstrated your concurrence in agreement with Prof. Gondo's parting words before he left 
the stage when he says all forms of knowledges, all epistemologies, should be brought together to solve societal changes, problems that we're seeking to bring about, to, to, to solve societal problems and bring about change and transformation as we face pandemics, crises, of this season in this country, on this continent, and globally. Thanks, co-editors, for that coordinated expression of the need to really have a mission that's expressed in the manner in which Prof. Michael Makanya's book has brought to us and is giving us. It actually is a Bible I want to say. It's a Quran that the university needs to take on seriously and begin to dissect and check on how could we live this legacy as being called by this cousins this evening. The program director and publisher of this book, who actually even in the middle of the night will send me messages saying, I'm going to said, go on, we shall get it done. I couldn't believe it when it was only yesterday that he confirmed it's happening. Thank you so much. Editor Mayan Tosane, the publisher and director of Unisa Press, who's made this possible despite such a very short time. At one point I had said to him, mm -mm, let's just step back. We're not going to be able to do this, but thank you so much. For getting this done. I appreciate your program directing as well and doing that on a Friday afternoon, evening actually, only four hours away from midnight. The public relations team within the institutional advancement did a huge job in actually making us believe that this was going to, to happen. This is why people who are in public relations and marketers I really regard them as somehow crazy people because they will pull up um, stunts that I wouldn't actually expect them to, to pull through. Thank you colleagues for, for having done that. Um, some of them are thought that we're here, I don't see them, I don't have my classes. But thank you so much for, for all the work that you did behind the scenes. I want to also thank my team on the operational floor of this book who braved COVID to ensure that it happens, who are not here, I have to thank you for the second time I know. I'll see you in next year's IPMS, not this year. The multimedia team and audiovisual team that's here, without whom we would be not hearing this sound, without whom we would not have solved the challenge we had earlier on with the Prof. Sabele Ndlovukajeni and all the photography colleagues, thank you. Without you, we would not have had the kind of launch that befits Prof. Mandla Makanya this evening. To estates, mostly the black women who cleaned this hall, who often get forgotten, we would have found this hall possible in a different state had those black women not come here and clean this hall and make it to be what it is this evening. We found it good because of you. Thank you, sisters. The various staff members whom I may not have mentioned for arranging all the logistics of this ceremony, I want to say, a launch, a celebration, the zenith. Thank you to all of you. Good evening. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Meiwa. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, who uh, sat here and enjoyed these two hours of knowledge impartation. 
Uh, what a celebration. Thank you, Professor Makanya, for uh, on your departure to leave us with this legacy that will live on for generations for generations. And, and I should indicate, uh, I think Unisa Press feels very privileged. It's one of the few university presidents who got the, the privilege to publish the speeches of an outgoing vice chancellor of the same university. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a great evening. It has been great to, to work with you. The launch has now come to an end. The book is available. The colleagues will indicate, but mainly the colleagues at Unisa Press will have the book, uh, Making of an African University in the Service of Humanity. Professor, Makanya Manda, Professor Amanda Makanya's speeches. Thank you. The launch is adjourned. <laughs> Professor Linda Bula and Professor Mayue, can I please ask you to join here for a photo opportunity? I'm going to be a photographer. Mr. Malulega, you are my boss. You, you, this is your thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I think it's one picture. <laughs>